I mean, you're just lonely. I remember crying myself to sleep during the first six months because I couldn't understand the language. I didn't know where I was. My companions were breaking rules. This wasn't what I was told by the church this would be. So I was sent home four months early from my mission. What would you want to say about that decision? So I went to Tampico, Mexico, and I was out 20 months. And You were um, the first of your friends to leave, too. First of my friends. So everyone saw you go out and leave. First grandkid. First grandkid. First child. Uh, Went to Mexico. Had a great mission. Very successful mission. There was a lot of baptizing in Mexico. There was a lot of opportunities in Mexico. The church was growing. This was 2007 to 2009. I had trained a lot of elders. Uh, I was working my way up the ranks. I even became executive secretary uh, to the mission president. And so I was in the mission offices for nine months and really worked hard to, to move up. Mexico was kind of a interesting mission, though. Latin America had just a different feel with rules. Commandments were always important, but mission rules were always stretched pretty pretty thin. I remember... Some of my early companions, when I first started the mission, would sneak out and go see girls or do things that I was confused by because we were on a mission. And I was always kind of shocked by that behavior. I even had the, the mission president, the first one I had, he even paired me up with another American elder who was an apostate. Like he didn't believe in the church and he had just three months left of his mission. Mm-hmm. And so he he asked me to help finish off this elder, like help him finish his last three months of his mission and see him out the door with honor. And so as a six-month-old missionary, I had to go spend three months with an elder who had his own theories and mm-hmm. was didn't believe. And refused to go out. Refused and... to knock doors, refused to do anything. So I was just kind of stuck for three months with an American elder. So I went from having a trainer who was sneaking out to see girls to an apostate sort of elder who didn't believe. Those were some rocky experiences as an elder. Didn't he? Who did he worship? He worshiped. Well, he had a theory around Satan. I don't even remember, but that Satan was also the son of God and that he was dealt the bad card. And yeah, he had some interesting. Some weird theories. And I just ignored him because my job as the, to, to make sure that I was people pleasing and, and, and listening to the mission president was to get this elder through his three last months. And then I got 19 months into my mission. Um, I've been in the mission offices for eight months as executive secretary. This mission president was much more understanding and loving. He's a big teddy bear of a man. And a lot of rules were broken during his tenure. A lot of Elders did what they wanted, but we were very successful. Lots of baptisms. And um, I even knew of elders who were having intimate relations with girls in the mission. And Meaning sex? Yes, having sex during their mission and with, with local girls. And, and I would have elders tell me that, and I would just try to be like their friend. And, you know, it was a lonely experience. So you're in Mexico. You don't understand the language for the first 6 to 12 months. It's really lonely. You're not allowed to call your parents. You, you can email them once a week. You can't, I mean, you're just lonely. I remember crying myself to sleep during the first six months because I couldn't understand the language. I didn't know where I was. My companions were breaking rules. This wasn't what I was told by the church this would be. And I always was told like, oh, it's a Latin America mission. Like rules are just broken here. It's not like the States where they're super strict. Mm-hmm. And we have lots of baptisms here, so it was always kind of like the rules can be broken. And so I very quickly broke down. Like it was like, oh, I guess we can go to the beach on P-Day and have four baptisms, you know, two days before that. And um, the success of the numbers always made us feel like we were somewhat above the rules. But then we got a new mission president during my last month of the mission, and he was a BYU football player and a military man and— he came in and very quickly cleaned up the mission. I was the first of many to be sent home. I was told somewhere in the number of 20 to 30 elders were sent home within his first three months in Mexico. And I was the one, one well, of the I first Well, I mean, if two. missionaries are having sex, sure. that's a problem. Sure. Well, a lot <laughs> of them... It was more than just missionaries having sex that were getting sent sure. home. Sure. Well, I didn't, I didn't do anything like that, mm-hmm. but I knew of elders who did. And I also saw elders go home with honor that were doing those things. And when he came in to try oh, to clean things missionaries up. missionaries having sex, but were... Released st- after f- their two full years were up. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I okay. know of several. And I and I 
just kind of saw that as part of this mission. And sure, he came in as a new mission president and rightly so wanted to clean things up. But he also pulled me aside and was like, you're a ringleader. You break a lot of rules. You know a lot of things about other elders. You're an office elder who, who has influence. And I want you to tell me now of all these elders you know about that have done bad things, even the ones that have been home, who have gone home with honor. And I refused to, I refused to narc. I refused to tell on other elders. I didn't, I never felt like I was an ecclesiastical leader who should tell on other, like that's between them and God is kind of how I always thought of it. And I, he didn't like that. And so I was one of the first ones sent home for breaking rules. And I always like to tell people, I broke rules, not commandments. I went to the beach. Uh, I think we saw the Avengers in movie theater one time. Yeah. Small things. I, I bought my own cell phone on the mission. Where Because he had terrible anxiety. Uh, to call my mom or my dad or text my mm-hmm. brother. It just makes me really sad Like when he's told me experiences because I know he struggles with anxiety and he felt so unsafe on his mission. Like you guys would get robbed. You didn't have warm water. You many times went to bed hungry. Your companions didn't have money for food. You paid for their food so many times. There were so many basic needs. Like you have Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And you need to have all of those things like a safe place to sleep, food and water, all of these things in order to have good mental health or even function normally in the world. And those basic needs weren't being met and you're paying to be on this mission where you don't have enough food to eat. (laughs) I just, it makes me so upset to, to think about that. Like there's no shortage of money. So why why are these elders living in these? Yeah. If if the Mormon church has $150 billion in cash and stocks and bonds, at least, Mm -hmm. and missionaries are paying for their own missions. Mm -hmm. Why are missionaries Mm -hmm. going hungry? And I had saved up for my own mission. So, most of my mission was paid for by myself. So $400 a month was coming from my own account. Wow. My grandpa also helped with some of it, but I I was paying, right? And often the Latin American elders I was with didn't pay their own way and they wouldn't have much money. And so I would go pull out of my, I used to carry my debit card in my sock because my my debit card in my sock meant if we got robbed or our backpacks were taken, I'd still have my source of money. Mm-hmm. And no one were you robbed in, on your mission? Multiple times. What? Yeah. Multiple times by gunpoint or not gunpoint. It was always knife point or just like multiple multiple That's people. Knife. Just just knife. Just point. Yeah, I guess well, knife. I guess I have friends who've been at gunpoint in mm. Africa, so I always think that it's less it's still than terrible. But yeah. I know I sort of minimize what happened, but yeah. they're breaking rules. Elders are breaking rules. It's the mission's not what I thought it was. We're having lots of baptisms though, so I think it's successful. But we're always out of money, and so I'm reaching out to family asking for more money. Hey, I want to buy tacos at night for myself because I'm hungry. And I, have, I live in a home with three other elders who don't have any money. I need to buy food for the four of us. And so I'd have generous family put money on my personal debit card, and I'd buy so many things for you wow. know these elders to get through it. Um, well, and many times the members couldn't afford to feed you. They were in poverty. And even if they did feed you, the conditions of their kitchen were not always sanitary. And so you got sick so many times. I lost 40 pounds in the first eight months. Just from like not being able to keep keep the sanitary food down. food down, and yeah. we walked everywhere, and you know I learned a lot during all of that. But it was like not what they say a mission will be. It's not a stateside mission. It was, it, it felt very much third world world country. Like even though it was Mexico and there was some Americanized things about it, we were definitely alone, and it was the anxiety and depression was really bad. I didn't know what that was at the time. Two thousand seven, anxiety and depression was barely spoken about, mm-hmm. and. When missionaries would go home for mental health issues, it was he couldn't hack it mm-hmm. or he's weak or whatever mean thing they would say to dismiss or he, you know, he can't, he can't, he can't do it. And so I didn't know I had bad anxiety. I didn't know what that was. I just was always a high performer. And so I thought I was just trying to do, you know, I, I got to get through this mission. I can't, I always had my mom's voice in the back of my head. You will go on a mission. Even when I was a teenager with girls, I would run away from a situation with a girl because my mom's voice was, you will go on a mission. <laughs> so I had this constant, like, I cannot disappoint my, mo- my mother, I cannot disappoint my grandfather. And so I'm out on this mission going, well, I have this, my first, my trainer, the guy who's supposed to teach me how to be a missionary is sneaking out at night. 
to go see a girl? Do I call the mission president? Like, do I narc on him? Do I have a conversation with him? And a lot of missionaries tried to make me reassure me that this is just part of the mission. Like, it's okay. And I was so green and so unaware of Spanish. I'm just trying to learn Spanish that I'm just like, okay, well, we're still, we're, we're teaching lessons. We're knocking doors. We're baptizing people all the time. Mm-hmm. We're doing what we're supposed to. It's fine if you have a, gr- a girlfriend. Like that was my justification. And then to have an elder for three months who didn't believe in the church. And my job was to help him finish his mission according to the president so he could return with honor was also a really terrible experience because for three months I sat in a room and just hung out with an American elder and he taught me Spanish and we went and got tacos. But he, he refused to work. He's like, I'm not going to work for these last three months of my mission. Mm-hmm. I'm only here because of my mother. And so I get about seven, eight months into my mission and that's my experience so far. And um, then I trained a few elders and that was actually great because I got to be the one who determined what it was like. You know, I got to train some fresh, fresh missionaries and then I got put in the mission offices. And that was actually a great experience because I got to answer the mission office phone. I learned really good Spanish that way. I got to meet a lot of people in the mission home and I was often by myself because there was the two assistants to the president and then there was the financial elder, financial secretary elder and the materials elder. So there were four elders in the mission office that would go out in their pairs of two. But I was the executive secretary, and so I would also often be with the mission president. He was kind of considered my companion, which was Mm -hmm. kind of interesting. We had one older couple that was there, and that was it. That was the entire mission office. One time recently, too, John, I got asked about, as an executive secretary in the mission offices, what were some of my responsibilities? Well, I got to keep, and I didn't realize this was so bad, but I kept the visas and the passports of all the elders in the entire mission Uh, under lock and key. I was the one who would go to the immigration offices to get them renewed every six months, get them stamped for approval. That was my job. And uh, I had a constant cycle of that because, you know, every every three weeks or every six weeks, there would be another group of visas I needed to take in and get stamped. So I have to present passport and the elders would show up. I'd have them meet me there at the immigration offices and I would present their visa and their passport. And... I would keep that in the mission office under lock and key and didn't think much of it. Like I was just responsible for keeping track of all those documents. So in theory, if an elder wanted to leave the mission and fly home, they could not unless they came to the mission office to get their documents, which I always thought was kind of odd, but I, didn't, I guess I didn't question it at the time, but I, yeah, I do now. I and what was hard for me is that, you know, I got this choice to tell on other missionaries with this new mission president. He came in ready to to make some changes into the mission. And I wasn't really willing to repent for others or talk for others or speak for others. So I went home without honor because I wouldn't I wouldn't lie or I wouldn't tell the truth about other elders. I wouldn't be that person. And so I think that 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 one's always affected me because I've always looked back and said, should I have just told on those elders? Should I have should I have been selfish? I could have had an honorable full-time release mm. if I had just told on the other elders. And several elders were sent home right after me. Um, there was a, a bunch of us. There were elders that reached out to me who got an honorable release just before I had got sent home who who had been having sex with girls on the mission who would apologize to me. Like, you got sent home. You didn't get the the glory or the the honorable return. And this was, this was devastating to my, my mom and to my grandpa. Like I didn't have a homecoming talk. I, it was a dishonorable discharge. Like it was like, I kept my recommend. I like to tell people that because they're like, Oh, you must've done something. I had my recommend. I didn't lose my recommend, which means I was sent home for breaking rules, not commandments, but there were elders who broke commandments and And rules and And rules and got an honorable uh, released with the with the nicer mission president who yeah. really just didn't want to know the details of what was going on because he had been in his third year mm-hmm. and was very tired. And so I got to have a little bit of leadership roulette, right? My first, I, I, I love the man that was my first mission president. I had him for 19 months. I learned a lot. Obviously, there were things in the mission that weren't great. He was so loving and kind. Even when he would be informed of things, he would, he would move elders to another area or he would do things to try and, to try and keep keep these elders, you know, in the mission. He was very kind. I even met him later on Yeah. before we got married, while we were dating. He was so sweet. 
and spoke so highly of you. And that was hard for me to understand. Like, how could this <laughs> mission leader speak so highly of this person who was sent home? Like, how can you have these two things coexisting mm. at the same time? It's almost mm-hmm. like two missions. It was like 19 months with yeah. him and then yeah. one month with the new, the new mission president. And he actually reached out to me uh, about a year later after sending me home early and wanted to sort of reconcile. He wanted to tell me he was sorry for, uh, I don't remember the words exactly, but it was about sort of being too harsh or mm-hmm. too, yeah. too rulesy or too, you know, because I didn't do anything that should have sent me home. It was, I wouldn't tell on others and I broke some rules that I could have easily repented for or moved areas. You know, going to the beach and having a cell phone and going to the movies once or twice was not, in my book, a reason to be sent home when there was so much other things happening. There. Yeah, and I'll just say like... For those who don't understand Mormon culture, being sent home from your two-year Mormon mission can be devastating in terms of your reputation, your uh, how you're perceived by fellow members of your ward, by family members, by women or men that you might want to date. You're basically shunned and shamed. It's going to be assumed by all that if you come home early, you committed some sort of sexual transgression, which again is considered to be next to murder and severity, but you're also just a huge disappointment. It's like, uh, yeah, it, it's just being viewed as a, as a spiritual failure and as a evil, sinful person. And so it's wrong that they do that for people who have sex on their missions. That's awful and horrible. Like, where's Christ? Where's the atonement? Where's forgiveness? Where's mental, you know, working with people? But to send someone home and to put that shame and stigma and scarlet letter on them for simply like not buckling to coercive pressure from a new mission president trying to make a statement that feels horrifically abusive to me given the consequences Mm -hmm. of that decision that would have affected you i don't mean to put all that on your experience what was it like coming home early it's a great description of everything that happened i I already said that my mom and my grandpa, like facing them was, Mm -hmm. I was already this high performing kid, the oldest of 18 grandkids. I didn't make mistakes. I didn't mess up. But even harder than facing my family was coming home and wanting to date again and wanting to like be a part of this Idaho Falls community that was very heavily LDS. And I remember reaching out to a couple girls that I had dated in high school who were now, you know, 18 or 19. And I remember I called one of them up and said, hey, I'm home and I'd like to take you on a date. We had dated in high school for several months and we were pretty close. And she said, "Um, I can meet you at a public park. And I was like, "Uh, okay. And she's like, and my mom wants my friend to come. And I was like, oh, I, I was hoping to take you on like a date and like, you know, talk again. And she said, well, we'll meet you at the park at this time. And so I got to the park, and there's this girl that I dated my last year of high school, and I loved her. She was my f- true first love. And she sat on a park bench with a, her best friend telling me that I was, like, unworthy to, to date. Like, I had come home early, mm-hmm. and um, her parents didn't want her to have anything to do with me. I just was in shock. I was just like, I don't understand like I'm I have my temple recommend like we can go to a session like I'm going to BYU Idaho soon like it was devastating to me I just I couldn't I I was in shock like why would why would this judgment be so harsh you don't even know what I did wrong like you don't know why I was sent home early it happened actually three different times where local families that I grew up with around in my local wards basically had said I'm sorry but I don't and I think rumors spread. I think people just think, oh, he's home early. Like, And it was weird because I was gone 20 months. I was almost done. Mm-hmm. I was four months away. And um, I think I'll all forever be judged for the, not finishing the four months. <laughs> so close. <laughs> and after two years, almost two years of just grinding through, like, all oh, the disobedience and the mission and like like this wasn't what I thought it would be <laughs> and we had so much success like I'm like we're baptizing people we're doing good we're having so many lessons the people were so receptive to us in Mexico <laughs> they loved American elders we we won a lot of people over <laughs> we brought a lot of gospel to a lot of people 
and I just was reject. I was fully rejected by the community in which I grew up. I don't know how I stayed in the church after that. I was just so scared of like, like the eternities. Like, I want to have an eternal marriage, and so I have to date Mormon girls. And if I've had three Mormon girls reject me for coming home early, like what? What's going to happen to me? And that's when I met Kim. I met Kim at that point. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only thing she asked me was, did you learn from the experience? (laughs) She was 18 and I was 21. And the only thing she cared about was like, not what I did on my mission or like what happened or am I worthy? (laughs) She said, did you learn from the experience? Like, do you have sorrow for what happened and are you moving on? Like she was understanding about it. Godly sorrow. Godly sorrow. Godly. It was the first girl that gave me the space to, like, heal or just feel like I had value because I'd already been rejected by my family and then my whole community in Idaho Falls, which is, like, very clicky, very Mormon. Everyone knows everyone. It's a city of about 100,000, so it just – everybody seems to know everyone in the stakes. Yeah. And when you don't get to have your homecoming talk, it's like, what happened to Elder Coffin? Like, why didn't he give a talk? It's like, well, I went to the movies and I went to the beach and then I didn't tell on all the other elders, like the 